Andrew Womack Ministries presents part five in Don't Limit God, a six-part series. This teaching by Andrew is titled Imagination, part one. We pray that the Word of God will come alive in your heart as you listen. Today I'm continuing to teach about Don't Limit God. I have covered a lot of material, talked about a lot of things, and now I'm entering into the last portion of this. So what I want to begin to talk about today is after the Lord finally spoke to me and showed me I was limiting Him, I understood that God doesn't just sovereignly make things happen. We have to cooperate and that we can limit God. Then I realized that I was just getting lazy. I was comfortable because we were at a place where things were working well and I wasn't stretched. and So I just didn't want to expose myself to the potential of failure. But I had to deal with the fear of failure. I had to deal with the fear of man. I had to deal with the fear of rejection, persecution. And what I talked about the last few days, I had to deal with the fear of success because I believe that success has ruined more people than hardship ever has. So I've talked about all of those things. What I want to begin to talk about today is after I made all of these uh, decisions and I realized I was limiting God, I overcame my complacency, my fear of rejection, punishment, my fear of success, all of these kind of things. And once I determine that, God, I'm going to take the limits off, I'm going to begin to think, then how do you do it? How do you actually implement this? There may be people who've watched every single program and you've tracked with me and you've identified with everything I've said. And so now you say, I realize I need to take the limits off God. How do I do it? Man, I'm going to say some things. There is so much to say and I'm aware that most people do not put the importance on your imagination that the scriptures do. We think that people who imagine things are, it's childish. Most people look at imagination like a fantasy. But man, the imagination is much more than a fantasy. That's one way you could use it, but that's really an inappropriate way to use it. But the Bible has a lot to say about imagination. Look at this scripture right here in Genesis chapter 6. And in verse 5, it says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created upon the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air. For it repenteth me that I have made them, and that's when the Lord brought the flood. So this shows that God knows the imagination of our hearts and He holds us accountable for what we imagine. And He actually brought judgment on people because of the imagination of their hearts. You know, in the New Testament, Jesus also reinforced this because the Old Testament law had said, Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill. But in the New Testament, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus came along and said, If you've lusted in your heart, you've already committed adultery. If you hate in your heart, you've already murdered. And you know what he's talking about there? He's talking about imagination. If you are thinking and longing for this in your heart, in your imagination, then you are already guilty of adultery. This shows that your imagination, and not just the actions is important. Now again, I am not saying that what you do isn't important, but I'm saying go deeper. Your actions are just a byproduct of how you think in your heart. Proverbs 23, 7 says, as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Most people want to change the so is he. They want to change the experience, but they don't want to change the way they think. But change starts with changing the way you think. I think it was Albert Einstein that said that it's a definition of insanity to do the same thing and expect different results. And yet there's a lot of people that are praying for healing, but you're thinking sick. They're praying for their marriage to be healed, but you are indulging in pornography and you are lusting and thinking things and you are doing things that are contrary. You know, there was a time that I went to my 40th year uh, reunion of our high school. And anyway, I was visiting with people and there was a girl there that we never dated or anything like that. But you know, in school, we flirted with each other. And I happened to be there by myself. And so I talked to this 
girl. And when I went back to my hotel room, I got to thinking, what would have happened if I'd have married her instead of Jamie? And I started thinking and imagining. And I mean, it didn't take five seconds or 10 seconds maximum. And I thought, where is this going to lead me? There is nothing good that can come out of this. And there's a lot of bad that could come out of it. And right then I said, I'm not going there. I'm not going to think this. But I can just um, imagine that there are people that do things like that and they allow themselves to start thinking, what would have happened if I'd have done this and done that? You can't be tempted with what you don't think. You have to imagine things. You have to conceive things in your heart. Let me share this passage of Scripture with you out of Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3. It's a passage that is often quoted, but I don't think that we get the full understanding of it. I'm not sure that I've got the full understanding, but boy, God has really been speaking to me through this. And it says in Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. There's a lot of things that you can teach from that verse. I use this often. But I want to show you that the word mind right here is the Greek word yetzer, Y-E-T-S-E-R. Excuse me, it's not Greek. It's Hebrew. The Old Testament is written in Hebrew. It was the Hebrew word yetzer. Uh, one of the concordances that I looked up in spells it Y-E-S-E-R. But anyway, however you spell that Hebrew word, that same word was translated imagination, I think, 12 times in the Old Testament. So this is talking about the Lord will keep you in perfect peace when your imagination is stayed upon Him. In other words, you can have thoughts, but thoughts paint pictures. Imagination, man, I'm, I'm saying a lot of things here that I wished I had time, but... If I get into all of the specifics and the details, you might lose my thoughts. So let me just say some things, and through the course of this, I'm going to come back and verify it with Scripture. But your imagination is your deep thought, not just your surface thoughts. It's the deep thoughts of your heart. And that's where you conceive things. As a matter of fact, this same Hebrew word, yetzer, here, the, the definition of it, I've got it right here, the definition is literally a form or figuratively conception. That's what that Hebrew word means. When it says when he, he'll keep you in perfect peace, whose mind, whose imagination is stayed upon him, this is saying that your imagination is your spiritual womb. It's where you conceive things. It's where conception takes place. That is a powerful statement right there. And I don't think that the average person gives this kind of importance to your imagination. Again, go back to Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, where God saw that the imagination of men's hearts was only evil continually. Did you know that that is true today? And some people will think, well, no, I don't sit here and just imagine evil things. But let me say that if the doctor says that you've got terminal cancer, you got stage 4 cancer, what happens to most people? They immediately imagine themselves dying. And especially if they've had some friend or relative that died of cancer, then that just helps them to paint that picture and they start seeing themselves dying and they have fear about the pain and they wonder, what's my funeral going to be like? Are my children going to be taken care of? You know what that is? That is your imagination. Here's what the dictionary defines imagination as. It says it's the ability to see something not clear or present. Now think about that. Your imagination is your ability to see something that you can't see with your physical eyes, but you can see it in your heart. Again, you may not use this word imagination very much, but you use your imagination constantly. You can't give directions without your imagination. You can't get home without your imagination. Did you know if I was... Like, I'm sitting in a building right now that's in Colorado Springs, and it's on Ford Street. And if you were here, and if I was to ask you, how do I get out to the interstate and head up to Denver? You know, if you were sitting in this room right now, there's no windows, you couldn't see anything. But if you were sitting here, and if you lived in this area, you could tell me, will you go down here to the Garden of the Gods Road? There's a light there, and you turn left, and you could tell me how many lights it is. You could count and say it's one, two, it's the third light 
is where you hit Interstate 25 and then you take a left and you head north. Now, most people, if you were sitting here with me and if you were here and if you knew these things, you don't sit down and consciously think and count that there's three lights between Ford Street and Garden and uh, Interstate 25. You probably have never counted that, and yet you could tell me how many lights because you know what? In your imagination, you can see it. You can look and count the lights. Here's another example. Most of you have never counted how many exterior doors you have in your house. But if I was to ask you how many exterior doors, how many outside doors do you have in your house? You could tell me, not because you've got that figure, that number stored in your brain. You can see it. You could go and you would look at your house and you could count them. I could say this, how many windows do you have in your living room? And most of you have never counted. You don't have that piece of information stored up here, but you can see it. In your mind, you can see your living room. You could count the windows. I know that this is really simple, but most people don't think about this. And they, they, they just, when I talk about imagination, they think, well, that's child's play. You know, just imagining stuff. I'm dealing in reality. You can't get home without your imagination. If you couldn't see how to get home, if you couldn't see that directions and that layout, you could not get home from work. You couldn't go anywhere. You can't function without your imagination. Your imagination is just your ability to see things. And whether you understand this or not, you think in pictures. You know, if I say dog, you don't see the letters D-O-G. What you see is a picture of a dog. And if I'm talking about a dog right now, did you know that there will be millions of different images, pictures, that's your imagination of a dog. And it's usually the one that you have. If you have a little small dog, you'll think of a small dog. If you have a big dog, you'll think of a big dog. Your image could be different based on your experience and what it is that you focused on. But did you know words paint pictures? And with my words, I could change your image. Some of you are thinking of a little tiny dog. I could say, think of a big dog, and immediately your image has to change. And then I'd say, think of a big black dog. Think of a big black dog that's mean with its teeth, you know, it's uh, showing and it's barking at you. And at, with words, I could paint a picture and I can change that image on the inside. You know, here's an example that I've used often, but when I was in Vietnam, we had what we call water blivets. Because I lived on a fire support base, it was completely shut off, and the only way we could be resupplied was by helicopters, and they would bring in our water in these water blivets. Now, the average person does not understand the word blivet. I never heard of it until I was in Vietnam. But with my words, I can paint you a picture of what a blivet was. It was a rubber thing. They were in cylinders. They were long cylinders, and on each end they had a brass end on it, and that's where the helicopters would hook a strap to, and it would hold on to these things. And they came in 250 and 500 and 1,000 and 1,500 gallon sizes, and uh, there would be a spigot on the end, and you would go and get your water from there and fill up your container. And as the water came out of the blivet, the, the atmospheric pressure would collapse it and the thing would just become flat and they'd pick it up and carry it off and bring in another one. It was black with these brass uh, things on the end. Now, you may not have a perfect picture of that, but with my words, even if you'd never heard of a water blivet, now you have a picture and you could retain that. But if you can't take information and put it with a picture, you'll lose it. Again, I don't think that most people have thought this way, but you think in pictures and images. If you can see something, if you can picture it in your imagination, then you can retain it. This is why so many people don't understand math, is because to most people, math is just a series of numbers. You memorize two plus two is four, but you don't picture it. You don't tie it to something. A good teacher will not just sit here and say two plus two is four, but they'll take something like, you know, two apples here. You got two apples, and now here's two other apples, and if you put them together, how many does that make? And if you can use it with illustrations and get people to picture things, then they'll see it. 
You know, I took advanced math and calculus and ratios and all of these things. And to most people, that stuff is just information and they lose it. They just learn it enough to pass the test in school, but they don't, they don't retain it because they don't see an application. But did you know every day of my life, I use math and ratios. Like I have a report. I have probably 200 pages of reports that come to me on a daily basis. And I look at things like, for instance, our phone calls. And if you're only on the second day of the month, we have an average of 22 work days in each month. And so if you only have two days worth of telephone calls, I'll take that number of calls and I'll multiply it times 10. And I know that I'm going to have probably at least that many phone calls and it helps me to anticipate how many people we have on our phones and all kinds of things. And so anyway, what that is, is a ratio. But see, most people can take that information. It means nothing unless they can see a practical use, unless they can see it, how it functions. If you can present things so that people see the application, they understand. In other words, if you can deal with their imagination, it will impact people and they'll be able to retain it. Let me give you this verse out of 1 Chronicles chapter 29. This is where David had made an offering to the Lord of billions of dollars of his own personal money. I figured it out at one time and tried to relate it to modern day currency and it would be over $2 billion worth of gold, silver, and precious stones that David gave from his own personal account towards the building of the temple. When he did that, the people were so touched that they began to give and they gave over $2 billion. So this was over a $4 billion offering that David took up. And when he saw this, he was overwhelmed. And he began to pray a prayer. And he said, God, we were slaves. We had nothing. And now here we are offering these billions of dollars worth of gold and silver and precious stones to you. And he says, but God, all we've done is just given back to you a portion of what you've given to us. It all comes from you. And he was just overwhelmed and he was praying this prayer. And let me break right into the middle of his prayer in first. Chronicles chapter 29, verse 18, it says, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, our fathers, keep this forever in the imagination of the thoughts of the heart of thy people and prepare their heart unto thee. So what he's saying here is, Lord, help them to remember this. Help these people not to forget it, but the terminology he used was keep this forever in the imagination of the thoughts of the hearts of thy people. In other words, you can't remember without your imagination. If you can't form a picture of something, you won't retain it. That's what I was talking about, math. To most people, it's just numbers. They don't see the application. But if you can ever see, not with your physical eyes, but see with your heart, with your imagination, why this works, how it works, if you can ever see it, you'll get it. You know, I built a deck on my house. And when we first moved in there, I mean, we had nothing but the house. And then you step outside of the house and immediately you were on the dirt. And uh, so I built a deck and it had three different levels on it. And I took a five gallon bucket and I turned it upside down and I sat out there for hours at a time just looking at all of this and thinking what I wanted this deck to be like, how I'd put the braces in, where the levels would be, how many, uh, you know, beams underneath I would have to have to support that. And I would sit out there hours at a time. One time Jamie even came out and asked what I was doing because I was just sitting on this bucket looking at this dirt. But you know what I was doing? I was thinking about it and imagining until I could see it. And once I thought through this process, and once I saw the deck that I wanted, then I went and I built that deck and it worked. But you know what? You have to see it first. This is why we have blueprints and that you build buildings because again, people will do what they see. And if I tell people I want a 3,200 seat auditorium, we're in the process of building this auditorium up in uh, Woodland Park, Colorado at our Karis Bible College. But you know what? I sat down and I told the people what I wanted. So they started drawing some things. We drew things on napkins at first and then they put out these drawings and we would look at these things 
and make sure that we were all picturing the same thing. And I would say, no, I want it this way. And they'd change the drawing. And so finally now we have a set of plans and we've built over $70 million worth of buildings. And it's because we all saw the same thing and you put this on paper. The point I'm trying to make this first day, before I start talking about how you apply this and start taking the limits off of God, you've got to understand that your imagination is important. It's your spiritual womb. As that word that was translated imagination implies, it's where conception takes place. If you can't conceive it in your imagination, you can't make it happen in, in the physical realm. You first of all have to conceive it. Just as a child has to be conceived before it's born, you can't just pray for a child. You've got to conceive a child. Likewise, you can't just pray for a breakthrough. You've got to conceive your breakthrough. You've got to conceive your miracle. And it takes place in your imagination. Your imagination is your spiritual womb. It's where you conceive things. It's powerful. And I, I think that most people don't understand this. They think that for me to spend time just thinking and imagining is wasting time. No, it is very productive. Let me use this verse over in Genesis chapter 11 to show you how important your imagination is. It says that the Lord came down in verse 5 to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and they, this they begin to do. And now nothing be, will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Right here it says that you imagine things. Again, I go back to Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3, where it says, The Lord will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. And the word mind there is the, Greek, uh, the Hebrew word yetzer, Y-E-S-T-E-R, and it means conception. And it was translated imagination 12 times in the Old Testament. So it says that when you keep your imagination stayed upon God, that is the spiritual womb. It's where you conceive things. And the Lord here said that nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. You have to conceive things in your imagination before you can ever see them happen on the outside. This is a huge statement. This is profound what I'm saying and I don't think most people understand this and this is why most people aren't succeeding in seeing greater things happen in their life is because they don't understand how important your imagination is. There are people that are praying for healing but have you ever seen yourself healed? That's a big statement right there. And see, most people, they will pray and, oh, God, heal me. But the doctor said you're going to die. And what you are seeing is your death. Especially if you've been around, say, for instance, that you were told that you had cancer and that you were going to die. And if you've been around somebody else who had cancer and you saw them go through the suffering and the pain and you saw them waste away and lose weight and lose their appetite and then die, if you have seen that, then you've got an image in your imagination. And sad to say, just like the Lord said over in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, that the imagination of their thoughts was only evil continually, most people are much more prone to imagine negative, evil things than they are positive things. If the doctor says you got stage 4 cancer, you're going to die, most people immediately can see themselves dying. They can see themselves suffering. They can see the hurt and the pain, and they see it. This is the image that they have on the inside. They see themselves sick. You know, I had a man come to me just this week, one of our students, and he says, I understand the Bible says by his stripes we're healed and all of these things. And he says, I'm not asking for prayer, but he says, how do I get from where I am to where I see myself well? And he began to tell me that he had for 40 years been on insulin and he had been a diabetic and he says, I just don't know how to get there. And I said, you're going to have to start seeing yourself well. And I told him, I said, you plan your whole life. Like if you go on a vacation, you have to think about all of your insulin. You have to think about checking your blood sugar. You see yourself this way. You see yourself that you can't ever be very long without eating certain things 
And I said, this is the image that you have. You have an image of yourself as a diabetic. And he was affirming everything I was saying and saying, yes, that's true. And I said, your healing is going to start when you start seeing yourself well. Before you pray and say, oh, God, heal me, you got to first of all say, oh, God, help change the image. You have to conceive your healing. I tell you, what I am saying is profound. This has changed my life, and yet I, I feel that the average person doesn't understand how important this is. You have an image of yourself on the inside, who you are and what you can do. And it acts like a governor on a car or on a truck or something. You know, you go to a certain speed, and that speed and that governor will just immediately shut the engine off, and you'll start coasting. You can't go above that. Well, most people have limits, an image of what you can do and things that you can do. And until you change that image, you cannot go beyond it. You, ha you make these limits upon yourself. You know, the Dale Carnegie course that was so famous, and I've heard people talk about it. Part of that course was you had to stand in front of a mirror and look yourself in the eye and say, you can sell, you can do this. And that may have been a physical, natural, carnal way of dealing with things, but the, the reason that worked for so many people is because it changed the image with your words. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Words can paint pictures. They can change the image. And so if you sit there and speak to yourself, you can do this, you can do this, eventually you will see yourself doing it. It's a physical, natural way of kind of jump-starting your imagination. But you can't go anywhere in the physical until you've already been there in your mind or in your imagination. Boy, that is a profound statement right there. It's just like if you were in an underground uh, mine or something like that. Did you know you just can't walk through dirt and rock what you have to do is dig out a place, hollow that out, remove the dirt and the rock, and once you've emptied that spot out, then you can go and stand in that spot. That's the way it is. You can't go anywhere in your physical body that you haven't already been in your mind. That's your imagination. You have to see things happening. Again, going back to this word, yet, sir, the Hebrew word, it means conception. You have to conceive a miracle. People are praying for healing, but have you conceived a healing? Have you taken the Word of God and painted an image on the inside of you? Can you see yourself well? You know, here's a classic example. I've used this many times, and some of you have already heard it, but it's just a great example. But I was actually listening to a teaching one time and there was a woman who had very poor eyesight. She was a pastor's wife, and she had these glasses that were so thick it was like looking through the bottom of a Coke bottle. And she had very poor eyesight, legally blind, and there was a healing evangelist that was coming to their church. And this woman didn't want him to pray for her because she'd been prayed for many times before, and it was always disappointing, and she just didn't want to be disappointed again. So she avoided this guy the entire week. Finally, the last night of the meetings, he just cornered her and he says, I want to pray for your eyes. So he made her take her glasses off and then he put his hands on her eyes and he prayed for her. And after he prayed, he says, now can you see? So this woman started to open her eyes and when she started to open her eyes, he says, shut your eyes. So she shut her eyes real quickly. And then he said a second time, now can you see? So she started to open her eyes and he says, shut your eyes. And this woman was wondering, well, what's he talking about? How can I sit, tell if I can see if I can't open my eyes? So the third time he says, now, can you see? And so she started to open her eyes again. And he says, shut your eyes. I didn't tell you to open your eyes. He said, you've got to see yourself seeing in your heart before you can see with your eyes. And she finally understood what he was talking about, that she had to see it in her imagination. She had to change the image. She had lived with poor eyesight so long that she had an image of herself as this person with very poor eyesight. She was limited and dependent upon those glasses. There was things she couldn't do. That's how she saw herself. She needed to see herself differently. So finally she understood what he was talking about and she kept her eyes closed and she just prayed in tongues 
FOR A WHILE, AND THEN SHE FINALLY SAYS, I CAN SEE IT. I CAN SEE ME SEEING WITHOUT GLASSES. AND SHE SAW IT IN HER HEART. WHAT SHE DID WAS CONCEIVE IT. AND THEN HE SAYS, NOW OPEN UP YOUR EYES. AND WHEN SHE OPENED UP HER EYES, SHE COULD SEE. SHE NO LONGER NEEDED HER GLASSES. AND SEE, I THINK THAT MOST PEOPLE MISS THIS STEP. MOST PEOPLE JUST SAY, OH, GOD, HEAL ME. BUT HAVE YOU SEEN YOURSELF WELL? YOU KNOW, SOME OF YOU, YOU HAVE ALLERGIES AND THINGS LIKE THIS. AND SINCE YOU WERE A LITTLE CHILD, YOU JUST, YOU DREAD CERTAIN TIMES OF THE YEAR. YOU DON'T GO CERTAIN PLACES. YOU DON'T MOW THE GRASS OR YOU DON'T DO CERTAIN THINGS BECAUSE OF ALLERGIES. YOU'VE GOT AN IMAGE AND IT JUST STAYS WITH YOU ALL OF THE TIME. AND YET YOU'RE PRAYING FOR HEALING OF ALLERGIES. BUT HAVE YOU EVER SEEN YOURSELF BEING NORMAL? HAVE YOU EVER SEEN YOURSELF RUNNING AND PLAYING IN THE GRASS OR GETTING AROUND THINGS THAT CAUSES YOUR ALLERGIES TO FLARE UP? AND THERE ARE MANY PEOPLE THAT YOU'VE NEVER SEEN YOURSELF WELL ON THE INSIDE. YOU'VE NEVER SEEN IT IN YOUR IMAGINATION, AND YET YOU'RE WANTING TO EXPERIENCE IT. AGAIN, I GO BACK TO THIS HEBREW WORD. IT MEANS, THE WORD THAT WAS TRANSLATED IMAGINATION 12 TIMES IN THE BIBLE MEANS CONCEPTION. YOUR IMAGINATION IS WHERE YOU CONCEIVE THINGS. AND SO PEOPLE ARE PRAYING FOR A RESULT WITHOUT CONCEIVING. THAT'S LIKE A WOMAN WHO PRAYS, OH, GOD, I WANT TO HAVE CHILDREN, BUT SHE NEVER HAS A PHYSICAL RELATIONSHIP WITH A MAN, AND SHE NEVER CONCEIVES ANYTHING. YOU'VE GOT TO CONCEIVE IT FIRST. AND THEN IT TAKES TIME FOR THIS CONCEPTION TO GROW AND MATURE, AND EVENTUALLY THERE'S A BIRTH. BUT THERE IS NO BIRTH WITHOUT CONCEPTION. WE UNDERSTAND THAT IN THE NATURAL REALM, BUT IN THE SPIRITUAL REALM, PEOPLE ARE PRAYING FOR A BIRTH OF HEALING, OF PROSPERITY, OR WHATEVER IT IS THAT YOU'RE BELIEVING FOR. YOU'RE PRAYING FOR THESE THINGS TO HAPPEN, BUT YOU'VE NEVER CONCEIVED IT IN YOUR IMAGINATION. YOU KNOW, THIS IS EXACTLY WHERE I WAS WHEN THE LORD SPOKE TO ME JANUARY THE 31ST, 2002. I KNEW WHAT GOD'S WILL FOR MY LIFE WAS. I HAD THIS MIRACULOUS ENCOUNTER WITH THE LORD IN 1968. AND I MEAN WITHIN DAYS, I KNEW THAT I WAS GOING TO HAVE A MINISTRY THAT WOULD SPAN THE WORLD, THAT WOULD TOUCH PEOPLE ALL OVER THE WORLD. I DREAMED ABOUT IT. I LONGED FOR IT. I BELIEVED IT WAS GOD'S WILL. BUT THERE WERE DECADES OF PREPARATION. AND YOU KNOW WHAT? IF I WOULD HAVE JUST KEPT YOU KNOW, PRESSING CONSTANTLY THAT I'VE GOT TO DO THIS, I'VE GOT TO DO THIS. I WOULDN'T HAVE BEEN FAITHFUL WHERE I WAS. THE LORD JUST SHOWED ME, YOU KNOW, BE FAITHFUL WHERE YOU ARE. DO WHAT I'VE GIVEN YOU TO DO RIGHT NOW. AND SO FOR DECADES, I KIND OF PUSHED THIS VISION ABOUT REACHING PEOPLE ALL OVER THE WORLD TO THE SIDE BECAUSE I WAS JUST PASTORING LITTLE CHURCHES. I WAS DOING THINGS STEP BY STEP AS GOD SHOWED ME, AND SO IT WASN'T TIME YET. BUT I KNEW WHAT GOD'S WILL WAS. I DIDN'T NURTURE IT A LOT BECAUSE IT WASN'T TIME. BUT FINALLY, THE LORD SPOKE TO ME JANUARY THE 31ST, 2002, AND TOLD ME THAT, MAN, I WAS LIMITING HIM. IT WAS TIME TO ACCOMPLISH THIS. AND ONE OF THE THINGS I HAD TO DO WAS TURN MY IMAGINATION LOOSE. I KNEW GOD'S WILL WAS FOR ME TO BE ON TELEVISION. I KNEW GOD'S WILL WAS FOR ME TO PREACH THE GOSPEL, the SPECIFICALLY THE GRACE GOSPEL, THE GOOD NEWS GOSPEL THAT IS IN SHORT SUPPLY. I HAD REVELATION OF God, WHAT GOD WANTED ME TO DO, BUT I HADN'T SEEN MYSELF DOING IT. I HAD SEEN MYSELF DOING IT TO A VERY SMALL DEGREE, AND I HAD SUCCEEDED TO A SMALL DEGREE. BUT I WOULDN'T ALLOW MYSELF. I DIDN'T TURN MY IMAGINATION LOOSE. AND AGAIN, THERE'S MANY REASONS BECAUSE OF FEAR OF PERSECUTION, FEAR OF ALL OF THESE THINGS I'VE ALREADY TALKED ABOUT. BUT PART OF IT WAS THAT FOR DECADES, IT JUST WASN'T TIME. AND I HAD FIT INTO THAT MOLD. I HAD GOT INTO THAT uh, METHOD OF OPERATION WHERE I WAS JUST PUTTING EVERYTHING ON HOLD. AND FINALLY, THE LORD TOLD ME, IT'S TIME FOR YOU TO GO FOR IT. AND ONE OF THE THINGS I HAD TO DO WAS JUST SIT AND START DREAMING. ALL RIGHT, HERE'S WHAT GOD WANTS ME TO DO. HOW DO I GET THERE? HOW DO I ACCOMPLISH THIS? HOW DO I REACH MORE PEOPLE? HOW DO I ACCOMPLISH WHAT GOD TOLD ME TO DO? AND I HAD TO START SPENDING A LOT OF TIME JUST DREAMING, imagination, IMAGINING THINGS. YOU KNOW, LET ME READ THIS QUOTE TO YOU BY T.L. LAWRENCE. I GOT THIS HERE. HE'S THE GUY THAT WE CALL LAWRENCE OF um, ARABIA. AND HERE'S HIS QUOTE. HE SAID, ALL MEN DREAM, BUT NOT EQUALLY. THOSE WHO DREAM BY NIGHT IN THE DUSTY RECESSES OF THEIR MINDS WAKE UP IN THE DAY TO FIND IT WAS VANITY. 
But the dreamers of the day are dangerous men, for they may act their dreams with open eyes to make it possible. In other words, there are some people that, you know, like a dream at night, and it's something that's based on foolishness or something, and, they, and it was vanity. It doesn't amount to anything. But people that can dream with their eyes open, not when they're unconscious, when they're conscious, and they can dream, they can see things with their heart that other people can't see. Those are the dangerous men, or you could say those are the productive people. And see, that's what the Lord was talking about here in Genesis chapter 11 when He came down and saw what the people were doing, and He says, Now nothing will be restrained unto them which they have imagined to do. The imagination, negative imagination, carnal imagination, evil imagination was so, uh, such a challenge or such a, uh, it was a threat to God's plans for the human race that He had to come down and confuse our languages. And this is where all the different languages on the earth came from, right here at the Tower of Babel. And He did it because if He didn't do it, they would be able to accomplish anything they could imagine. This really puts a huge importance on your imagination. Your imagination is where you conceive things. And sad to say, our world today is constantly trying to put down your imagination. The very first thing, if you go to a doctor, he's saying, now don't get your hopes up. He will give you the worst case scenario. And there's many reasons for that, but one of the reasons is because of litigation, because of liability. If a doctor didn't tell you what the potential problem was and then a person goes ahead and dies, or something, you could come back and sue the doctor. But if the doctor paints the worst case scenario and deals with it, at least he told you. And so for liability issues, they will sit there and tell you the worst case and tell you not to get your hopes up. But the very thing you should do is get your hopes up. Man, if you just take the worst case scenario and if you see yourself dying, if you see this thing destroying, that's the worst thing that can happen. You need to have a positive imagination. But our world system will just constantly try and get you to sink to the lowest level, to expect virtually nothing. There are people that have been disappointed and that is so hurtful to them as it says over in Proverbs chapter 13, I believe it's verse 12, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but when the desire comes, it's like a tree of life. And because people don't enjoy having your hopes dashed, you don't enjoy uh, this sick feeling when something you've been believing for doesn't come to pass. There's some people that go through life just trying to never hope anything. They aren't shooting at anything. They don't want to expose themselves to dreaming something bigger because they might be disappointed. And so there are many people that go through life just constantly trying to not get their hopes up, not to believe for anything. But I'm telling you, if you are going to make an impact, you need to get your hopes up. You need to start using your imagination in a powerful way. Here in Genesis chapter 11, the imagination was so powerful that it threatened God's plans for the human race, and He had to do something to limit our ability to communicate and inspire each other with our imagination. Now, just think about this. If something threatened God's plans, that must be pretty powerful. That's how powerful your imagination is. And that's talking about imagination in a negative way, but you can turn around and use it in a positive way. I tell you, if you can dream it, if you can see it on the inside, you can see it happen on the outside. And I don't think that the average person thinks that way. They don't even understand what imagination is. Many people think imagination is childish, that children have an imagination. You know, I heard a, a guy, Roland, uh, that runs the Colorado Springs Christian School. He came and spoke at our Bible college, and one of our speakers had been speaking along these same things, and Roland got up, and since he deals with children all the time, he, he gave an illustration to where he asked, you know, I forgot the age now, but they were young people, like four or five-year-olds or something like that. How many of you are artists? How many of you can draw? And did you know 100% of the hands went up and they all believed that they could draw? And then he asked the exact same question to high school students. How many of you can draw? And there was just two or three. 
You know what? When people are young, they just imagine they can do anything. And he said that by looking at their drawings, they couldn't all draw, but they imagined they could. And if that imagination would have been nurtured, that many more of them, if not all of them, might have been able to draw. But see, through the years, you draw something and somebody criticizes it, and man, it affects you, and, and you just limit, and you start putting limits on it. And again, I, I'm aware that certain people have certain talents and abilities, but I'm saying that we are, uh, children just believe that they can do anything. They have this vivid imagination, but as you become adults, most people just, in a sense, discard their imagination, or they think they do. The truth is you still use your imagination constantly. You know, I took a tour to Israel one time, and I was the tour guide, and there was about 40-something people on this tour. And anyway, we were on a bus, and I remember driving through the Valley of Elah, where David fought Goliath. And, it's, and at that time, this has been 20 or something years ago, I don't know exactly how it is now, but at that time there was basically nothing there. And there were these hills that were round about this valley, and they were miles apart from each other, just exactly the way that the Bible describes it. And so we drove there, and the bus driver stopped on the side of the road and said, this is where David fought Goliath. Does anybody want to get out? And it was a hot day. People were enjoying the air conditioning in the bus. Nobody wanted to get out except me. But man, I got out and I walked way out there and I walked down to this little stream that flowed through and I picked up five smooth stones just like what David did in 1 Samuel chapter 17. And I stood there and I looked around and I imagined what it would have been like for David to be in that exact same spot and pick up those five stones and go fight Goliath with hundreds of thousands of people on these mountains round about. I was imagining. I couldn't see any of these things, but the Word of God had given me a report, and I just imagined it. And I mean, it made that come alive. And did you know that people were on this tour? Many of you, I'm sure, have been to the land of Israel, and one of the common comments that I hear often when people are advertising it, it says it makes the Bible come alive. And people go over there and they have these epiphanies. They have these experiences with the Lord where the Lord touches them. And some of the people that were on my tour were saying there's just an anointing on this place that we've never seen before. The Bible is so real. God is so real here. Did you know what is actually happening? I don't believe that there is an anointing on the land of Israel more than there is here in Colorado or any place wherever you are. And I know some people are offended by this. I don't mean to be offensive. I'm just saying, I think that what makes the Bible come alive when you go to Israel is the fact that these things you've read about and you've got information, but you haven't meditated on it until it forms a picture. It hasn't affected your imagination. But when you go there and when you see it, all of a sudden you can picture the things that the Bible is saying and the Bible just comes alive. This is profound. Let me turn over here to Psalms chapter 1 and share this with you. In Psalms chapter 1 and in verse 2, it says, but his, it's talking about the godly man who, um, well, let me just read verse 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. This word meditate in the Hebrew is the exact same word that is used in chapter 2, verse 1, where it says, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? It's the exact same word. So by putting this together, when it says that in his law doth he meditate day and night, it's talking about in his law he imagines. He takes the word of God and meditates on it until it sparks his imagination. This is what I was saying about when you tour the Holy Land. The reason things just come alive, the Bible becomes so real, is because you've read about David fighting Goliath, and you may know some of the details, but when you go there, when you see it, it helps your imagination. And this is where everything happens. As I've already said in Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3, the word that was translated mind there was also translated imagination. 
AND THAT HEBREW WORD MEANS CONCEPTION. IT'S WHERE YOU CONCEIVE THINGS. IF YOU CAN SEE IT, THEN IT BECOMES ALIVE TO YOU. YOU KNOW, THERE'S BEEN TIMES THAT I'VE BEEN TRYING TO THINK ABOUT, GOD, HOW DO I DO SOMETHING? AND I'M JUST PRAYING AND I'M MEDITATING ON IT, AND ALL OF A SUDDEN, I SEE. IT'S NOT THAT I SAW WITH MY EYES, BUT I SAW IN MY HEART WHAT GOD WANTS ME TO DO. I MAY NOT HAVE ALL OF THE DETAILS, BUT ONCE I SEE IT ON THE INSIDE, I'VE GOT IT. I'VE GOT IT. YOU KNOW, BUILDING THESE BUILDINGS THAT WE'RE BUILDING, WE'RE BUILDING OVER $70 MILLION WORTH OF BUILDINGS IN THE LAST FIVE AND A HALF YEARS, DEBT FREE. I HAD TO SIT DOWN AND SEE THOSE BUILDINGS FIRST. I HAD TO MEDITATE AND SEE THINGS. AND I REMEMBER TRAVELING OVER IN GERMANY, AND I SAW AN AUDITORIUM THAT I MINISTERED IN OVER THERE, AND I THOUGHT, THIS IS WHAT I'VE BEEN LOOKING AT. IT WAS VAGUE TO ME. I DIDN'T HAVE A CLEAR PICTURE, BUT WHEN I SAW THAT AUDITORIUM IN uh, KARLSRUHE, I THOUGHT, this is, the, THIS IS WHAT I'VE BEEN WANTING. AND IT FIT THE VISION THAT I HAD ON THE INSIDE, AND IT HELPED MY IMAGINATION TO SEE IT CLEARER. AND SO OUR AUDITORIUM THAT WE'RE BUILDING ISN'T EXACTLY LIKE THAT, BUT IT WAS INSPIRED BY THAT, AND IT HELPED ME TO SEE THINGS. YOU KNOW, THIS IS WHY WHEN YOU'RE DESIGNING A HOUSE AND STUFF, PEOPLE WILL GO LOOK AT MAGAZINES AND THEY'LL LOOK AND WHAT IT DOES, IT HELPS YOUR IMAGINATION. YOU HAVE TO SEE THINGS ON THE INSIDE BEFORE YOU SEE THINGS ON THE OUTSIDE. AND PEOPLE SOMEHOW OR ANOTHER HAVE MISSED THIS. BUT THIS IS WHAT MEDITATION IS. IT SAYS IN HIS LAW DOTH HE MEDITATE DAY AND NIGHT. THAT SAME WORD THAT WAS TRANSLATED MEDITATE WAS TRANSLATED IMAGINE IN CHAPTER 2 VERSE 1. YOU CANNOT MEDITATE WITHOUT IMAGINING. I REMEMBER WHEN I WAS A KID, STILL LIVING AT HOME BEFORE I GOT MARRIED, AND I WAS READING ABOUT DAVID FIGHTING GOLIATH, AND I TURNED TO A COMMENTARY, AND THE COMMENTARY, MOST OF THEM SAY THAT GOLIATH WAS LIKE NINE FOOT, SIX INCHES TALL. SO WHAT I DID WAS GO OUT ON A TREE, AND I MEASURED WHERE NINE FOOT, SIX INCHES WAS, AND THEN I BENT DOWN, BECAUSE MOST COMMENTATORS BELIEVE THAT DAVID WAS PROBABLY AROUND FIVE FEET TALL, AND I'M TALLER THAN THAT, SO I STOOPED DOWN SO THAT I COULD GET HIS PERSPECTIVE AND LOOKED UP AT THAT. AND YOU KNOW WHAT I WAS DOING? IT WAS HELPING ME IMAGINE WHAT DAVID MUST HAVE EXPERIENCED AS HE SAW GOLIATH. AND BECAUSE, SEE, THIS IS THE WAY I STUDY THE BIBLE. I DON'T JUST READ SCRIPTURES AND STORE INFORMATION AND QUOTE VERSES, BUT I WILL TAKE WHAT THE WORD SAYS AND THEN I'LL IMAGINE. I'LL MEDITATE ON IT UNTIL IT PAINTS A PICTURE ON THE INSIDE OF ME. YOU KNOW, THE VERY FIRST TIME I EVER SAW A PERSON RAISED FROM THE DEAD, I TOOK JOHN CHAPTER 14, VERSE 12, THAT SAYS, ver JESUS WAS SPEAKING, AND HE SAID, VERILY, VERILY, I SAY UNTO YOU, HE THAT BELIEVETH ON ME, THE WORKS THAT I DO SHALL HE DO ALSO, AND GREATER WORKS THAN THESE SHALL YOU DO, BECAUSE I GO UNTO MY FATHER. AND I WAS MEDITATING ON THAT. I DIDN'T JUST READ IT. NOW, SEE, I JUST QUOTED THAT VERSE TO YOU. I COULD QUOTE IT, BUT I DIDN'T JUST QUOTE IT. I TOOK IT AND I BEGAN TO MEDITATE ON IT, THINK ABOUT IT, AND I BEGAN TO SEE THAT GOD SAID WE WOULD DO THE SAME WORKS HE DID AND EVEN GREATER WORKS. WELL, JESUS RAISED THE DEAD, AND AT THAT TIME, I HAD NEVER SEEN A PERSON RAISED FROM THE DEAD. AND SO I SAID, HE PROMISED THAT THE SAME THINGS HE DID, WE WOULD DO, AND THEN OVER IN MATTHEW CHAPTER 10, VERSE 8, HE SAYS, GO HEAL THE SICK, heal the sick CLEANSE THE LEPERS, RAISE THE DEAD, CAST OUT DEVILS. IT'S A COMMAND TO DO IT. AND SO I BEGIN TO REALIZE THAT, YOU KNOW WHAT, GOD HAD GIVEN ME POWER AND AUTHORITY THAT I WASN'T SEEING FUNCTIONING. SO I BEGIN TO START MEDITATING ON RAISING THE DEAD. I TOOK EVERY INSTANCE IN THE BIBLE WHERE A PERSON HAD BEEN RAISED FROM THE DEAD. AND AGAIN, YOU KNOW, uh, WHEN JESUS ROSE FROM THE DEAD, IT SAYS MANY CAME OUT OF THE GRAVES AND WALKED IN THE CITY. I'M NOT INCLUDING THAT BECAUSE IT DOESN'T, IT'S NOT A SPECIFIC INSTANCE, IT'S JUST A PASSING a MENTION. BUT IF YOU JUST LOOK AT THE PEOPLE THAT WERE RAISED FROM THE DEAD, THERE WERE EIGHT PEOPLE IN THE BIBLE THAT WERE RAISED FROM THE DEAD STARTING IN 1 KINGS CHAPTER 17. AND I TOOK ALL OF THESE INSTANCES OUT OF THEIR CONTEXT AND JUST PUT THEM ON MY COMPUTER. AT THE TIME, IT WAS JUST A, a LEGAL PAD. AND I BEGIN TO WRITE THESE THINGS DOWN. AND I WOULD TAKE THOSE VERSES AND I WOULD MEDITATE ON IT UNTIL I GOT TOTALLY FAMILIAR WITH THE FACTS. AND THEN, AFTER I HAD THE STORIES AND, and I FELT LIKE I UNDERSTOOD THEM COMPLETELY, I WENT EVEN FURTHER THAN THAT AND I BEGIN TO IMAGINE WHAT IT WAS LIKE FOR ELIJAH 
to stretch himself upon the child and put his hands upon his hands and his mouth upon his mouth and his, uh, you know, body upon his body and pray for him and feel his flesh wax warm. And I, you know, I know some of you are going to think I'm weird, but I think you're weird not to use your imagination. I not only saw Elijah doing this, I saw me doing it. I remember getting on a bed and imagining that there was a body there and that I was going through this and I imagined it. And then I imagined myself being like Elisha and raising the Shunammite widow woman's son from the dead. And I imagined myself being like Jesus speaking to Lazarus and with a loud voice. I, would, I got all of the details and then I would not only see Jesus doing this, I would see me doing it. I would see me standing in front of that grave and calling forth somebody from the dead out of the tomb who had been dead for four days. And I spent months doing this and I would imagine it and focus on it. And it got to where I was so focused on it that when I slept at night in my dreams, I would raise 20 or 30 people a night from the dead. It was a focus and it got so real that even in my subconscious, I was thinking about this and then all of a sudden, a person died. And I, I spoke to him and saw him raised from the dead. And some people don't connect these things and they think, well, that was just an individual instance. No, I had to conceive it. Again, the word yet, sir, that was translated mind in Isaiah 26, 3, it was also translated imagination and it literally means conception. I conceived this miracle and I saw two people raised from the dead because I had been meditating on this and imagining myself doing it. And then I went, I don't know how long it was, it was over a decade, maybe 12 years or more, and I one time thought, I said, you know what? It's been a long time since I've seen a person raised from the dead. So I went back and did the same thing. And I started studying all of the instances where somebody was raised from the dead. And I got to thinking about it. And again, it got to the point that I would dream about it at night. And in my dreams, I would raise dozens of people from the dead every night. And then my own son died on March the 4th. 2001. He had been dead for five hours, four hours when they called me. And I spoke and my wife and I prayed and agreed and agreed and praise God, my son was raised from the dead after being in a morgue, stripped naked. The doctors had pronounced him dead, had a toe tag on him in a freezer. And when we spoke, he sat up. And you know what? There is a direct relationship between that and my imagination. I had gone back and started meditating once again on seeing people raised from the dead. And there is a reason why my son was raised from the dead because I had conceived it. There's many people watching this that would love to see the supernatural power of God operate in your life. And you may pray for it, ask for it, beg for it. You can fast for it. You can have people lay hands on you until they rub all of the hair off the top of your head. But if you don't conceive it, you will not give birth to it. And your imagination is where you conceive things. It's your spiritual womb. Are you seeing the things that you are praying for come to pass? Have you seen it? Do you have this image on the inside? Or do you have an image of yourself as being inferior? You know, this is also a part of this whole thing that I've been sharing. January the 31st, 2002, when the Lord told me I had limited him through my small thinking, one of the things that had happened, I had never seen myself reaching people worldwide. I hadn't seen myself as being a leader. Now, I had information. If you would have asked me what God's will for my life was, I could have told you that someday... I'm going to make a worldwide impact. And again, I wish I had more time to explain this. I know that there's people that are going to question my motives. I am not bragging on myself. I'm saying that God told me I was going to reach people all over the world. I have known that for 50 years, but I didn't see myself doing it. I knew it was God's will. I knew that that's what he wanted. I was moving that direction incrementally, step by step. But in 2002, the Lord showed me I was really hindering him. And I hadn't let myself, I hadn't allowed myself to see me 
really making the impact that I know God wanted me to do. And you know what? I still deal with this today. We're celebrating 50 years now of ministry and we've just had some people come in and give me congratulations and stuff and I'm just shocked. I'm shocked that these people even knew who I was. I just, I still, it's hard for me to see myself in the position that God really has put me in. I'm just being candid with you. I know that there's people that'll criticize me over it and stuff like that, but I'm just being honest with you. It's, I've, I was used to being accept, rejected. I was used to being passed over. But you know what? It's hard for me to get used to people accepting me and stuff. And I have to change the images on the inside. You cannot do what you haven't seen yourself doing. And back in 2002, I had not seen myself succeeding. I think I already gave this example, so I'm not going to go into the detail, but Lynn and Kathy Mink interviewed me on a radio program, and they just were talking about how I had touched their life and impacted them, and it shocked me. And so when we went out to eat afterwards, I said something to them about, I'm just surprised that God used me to touch your life 20 years ago. And, th and they got on my case in a sense saying, what's wrong with you? You've been on radio all over the United States for 20, 30 years, and you're surprised that somebody was listening? And you know what? I just had never allowed myself to think that way. I was doing what God told me to do, but because of a fear of pride and a fear of what it would do to me and stuff, I just had never allowed myself to see that I was making this impact, and because of it, I could not make a greater impact until I saw myself doing it. And many of you, that image has been skewed. It's not a correct image because you've had people criticize you. You've had people come out against you. You've had failures in your life. Maybe you've been fired from jobs. Maybe you've lost a marriage. Maybe you've had things happen, and because of it, it has changed your image from what God, how God sees you and what God wants you to do, and you are limiting Him because somebody else has said you'd never amount to anything, and you have accepted those words and allowed those words to paint a picture on the inside of you, and it's limiting what God can do in your life. You are going to have to change that image. You're going to have to go, what is it that God has called you to do? Like if it's like I was sharing today, if you believe that God told you the same works that He did, you will do also. So therefore, you need to see the sick healed. You need to see the blind eyes open, deaf ears open. You need to see the dead raised. If you don't take those truths and meditate on it until you see yourself doing it on the inside, before you ever see it on the outside, if you don't allow yourself to go there and see yourself laying hands on the sick and recovering, if you don't see yourself prospering financially, you'll never do it. You've got to see yourself. And getting around people who are, you know, increasing their imagination and increasing what they're believing for, it's contagious. It'll rub off on you. You know, there was a time that I went golfing at a real fancy place and the guy, my media buyer, Doug Neese, he's, he's a great guy and he's a lot more prosperous than I am personally, you know, in his personal finances. And anyway, we played at this fancy golf course, the Broadmoor in Colorado Springs, and the caddy came up at the end and he was cleaning my clubs and I was going to give him a tip. You're supposed to give him a tip. And all I had was a $20 bill. So... Anyway, I leaned over to Doug and I said, hey, if you got change for a 20, I was going to give the caddy a $5 bill. If you got change, and he just looked at me and he says, I'll take care of it. And he went around and gave every one of the caddies a $20 bill. Made me feel so small, so cheap. And I realized that, you know what? I had an image on the inside of me that was cheap. So you got to change that image. Instead of being cheap, instead of always buying the cheapest thing, the cheapest thing's not always the best thing. Many of us were raised with a poverty mentality, and yet you're trying to believe for prosperity. Have you ever seen yourself prosperous? You have to see it on the inside before you can see it on the outside. You have to conceive a miracle before you can birth a miracle. Let me give you an example of this. Here in Mark chapter 6 is where there was thousands of people coming to hear Jesus. They had been with Him all day long. 
AND uh, THE DISCIPLES OF JESUS CAME TO HIM IN MARK CHAPTER 6, VERSE 36, AND SAID, THEY SAID TO JESUS, SEND THEM AWAY THAT THEY MAY GO INTO THE COUNTRY ROUND ABOUT AND INTO THE VILLAGES AND BUY THEMSELVES BREAD, FOR THEY HAVE NOTHING TO EAT. HE ANSWERED AND SAID UNTO THEM, GIVE YE THEM TO EAT. AND THEY SAID UNTO HIM, SHALL WE GO AND BUY, buy 200 PENNY WORTH OF BREAD AND GIVE THEM TO EAT? YOU KNOW WHAT THEY WERE DOING? THEY WERE GIVEN A COMMAND. YOU GIVE THEM SOMETHING TO EAT, AND IMMEDIATELY THEY LIMITED GOD TO WHAT THEIR PHYSICAL RESOURCES WERE. THAT WOULD BE LIKE ME PULLING MY WALLET OUT OF MY POCKET AND SAYING, MAN, THIS WOULD COST, YOU KNOW, A PENNY WAS A DAY'S WAGE, SO 200 PENNY WORTH WOULD BE, ARE WE SUPPOSED TO SPEND 200 DAYS WAGE? ON FEEDING THIS MULTITUDE? THEY LIMITED GOD BECAUSE THEY ONLY LOOKED AT THEIR OWN RESOURCES. WHAT THEY SHOULD HAVE DONE WAS RECOGNIZE THAT THEY HAD GOD RIGHT THERE IN THEIR PRESENCE, AND HE WAS LIMITLESS, AND HE COULD SUPPLY THEIR NEEDS SOME WAY BEYOND JUST THEIR PHYSICAL, FINANCIAL ABILITY. SEE, WITH ME, THIS WAS A THING. I KNEW THAT GOD WANTED ME TO HAVE A WORLDWIDE MINISTRY TO REACH PEOPLE ALL OVER THE WORLD, TO BE TOUCHING MANY, MANY MORE PEOPLE THAN WHAT I WAS DOING, BUT I WAS CONSTANTLY LIMITING GOD BY LOOKING AT MY RESOURCES, BY SAYING, GOD, I DON'T HAVE ENOUGH MONEY. AND WHEN I HAD THIS EXPERIENCE WITH THE LORD ON JANUARY THE 31ST, 2002, ONE OF THE FIRST THINGS I DID, I SAID, GOD, I AM NOT GOING TO LIMIT YOU BY LOOKING AT WHAT I HAVE THE RESOURCES TO DO. I'M GOING TO BELIEVE THAT YOU CAN PROVIDE ME WITH EXTRA. AND SO ONE OF THE THINGS I BEGAN TO DO WAS JUST SIT BACK AND START DAYDREAMING, WHAT SOME PEOPLE WOULD CALL IT, BUT BASED ON SCRIPTURE, I WOULD START USING MY IMAGINATION. WHAT WOULD I DO IF MONEY WAS NO OBJECT? WELL, I CAN GUARANTEE YOU SOME OF THE FIRST THINGS I THOUGHT, I'D GO ON MORE TELEVISION STATIONS, I'D REACH MORE PEOPLE. THERE'S LOTS OF PEOPLE THAT WOULD RECEIVE WHAT GOD HAS TO SAY THROUGH ME IF I COULD JUST REACH THEM. AND SO I BEGAN TO START ADDING RADIO STATIONS, TELEVISION STATIONS. I BEGAN TO START DOING THINGS. THEN THE LORD SPOKE TO ME ABOUT BUILDING A BIBLE COLLEGE CAMPUS. AND DID YOU KNOW MY FIRST REACTION, AGAIN, MOST OF US HAVE BEEN TAUGHT HOW TO LIMIT GOD, AND, YOU KNOW, YOU'VE GOT TO BE REALISTIC, AND DON'T JUST DREAM OF ALL OF THESE THINGS. I SAT DOWN, AND I TOOK THE LIMITS OFF, AND I SAID, WHAT DO I HAVE IN MY HEART? IF MONEY WASN'T AN OBJECT, WHAT IS IT THAT I WANT TO DO? AND I SAT DOWN AND STARTED TALKING TO THESE ARCHITECTS, AND WE DESIGNED BUILDINGS. AND I FORGET THE EXACT LENGTH OF TIME, BUT I KNOW IT WAS OVER A YEAR. I THINK IT WAS NEARLY TWO YEARS OF A PROCESS OF ME SITTING DOWN WITH ARCHITECTS, DESIGNING BUILDINGS, TALKING ABOUT THAT I WANTED STONE, I WANTED TIMBER, I WANTED THESE KIND OF FLOORS, I WANTED ALL OF THIS, AND WE DESIGNED IT. AND IT WAS NEARLY TWO YEARS. IT WAS FOR SURE ONE YEAR, BETWEEN ONE AND TWO YEARS, BEFORE WE EVER SAT DOWN. WE HAD THE PLANS DRAWN. YOU COULD HAVE BUILT THE BUILDINGS, AND I SAID, WHAT'S THIS GOING TO COST? <laughs> I NEVER DID MENTION MONEY. There, THERE WAS ONE TIME WE MENTIONED MONEY. NOW, I, I WANT TO PUT THIS IN SO THAT YOU DON'T JUST REALIZE THAT I THREW ALL LOGIC OUT THE WINDOW, BUT THERE WAS ONE TIME THAT DOWNSTAIRS, I WAS WANTING THIS ROOM THAT SEATS ABOUT 700 PEOPLE IF YOU HAVE ALL OF THE DIVIDERS OPEN. I WAS WANTING THIS ONE ROOM NOT TO HAVE A POST IN THE CENTER. AND THEY SAID, IT CAN BE DONE, BUT IT'S GOING TO COST YOU A MILLION AND A HALF DOLLARS TO HAVE THIS THING TOTALLY OPEN WITHOUT THIS CENTER POST. AND YOU KNOW WHAT? WHEN I THOUGHT, WELL, FOR A MILLION AND A HALF DOLLARS, I THINK I COULD LIVE WITH THE CENTER POST. SO I'M NOT SAYING THAT I DIDN'T ACKNOWLEDGE ANY THINGS ABOUT BEING PHYSICALLY RESPONSIBLE, BUT I DIDN'T SIT THERE AND LET MONEY, YOU KNOW, SAY, YOU KNOW, WE DON'T HAVE ENOUGH MONEY IN OUR POCKET TO FEED ALL OF THESE PEOPLE. I DIDN'T LIMIT GOD BY LOOKING AT MY PERSONAL RESOURCES. I JUST THOUGHT, GOD, WHAT'S REALLY IN MY HEART? WHAT IS IT THAT I BELIEVE THAT YOU'VE GIVEN ME TO DO? AND IF ANY OF YOU HAVE EVER COME TO OUR FACILITY UP IN WOODLAND PARK, COLORADO, IT'S A BEAUTIFUL FACILITY. I MEAN, IT'S NOT CHEAP, BUT IT'S NOT EXTRAVAGANT EITHER. IT'S JUST WHAT I HAD IN MY HEART. IT'S WHAT I DESIGNED, AND MAN, PEOPLE LOVE IT. I'VE ASKED A LOT OF OUR PARTNERS WHO CAME HERE, I SAID, SO HOW DO YOU LIKE WHAT YOU'VE BUILT? AND MAN, THEY LOVE IT. AND I BELIEVE IT'S WHAT GOD DESIGNED. BUT I, I HAD TO LEARN NOT TO LIMIT GOD. AND I, I JUST SAT BACK AND STARTED DREAMING. WHAT WOULD I DO IF MONEY WASN'T AN OBJECT? AND YOU KNOW WHAT? BASICALLY, THAT'S WHAT I'VE DONE. 
AND I MEAN GOD HAS BLESSED US, AND I KNOW THAT I'M SPEAKING TO PEOPLE. I JUST PRAY THAT I'M COMMUNICATING TO YOU BECAUSE I KNOW THAT THERE ARE PEOPLE THAT GOD HAS MORE FOR YOU. GOD WANTS YOU TO REACH OUT AND TOUCH PEOPLE AND MAKE A DIFFERENCE, AND YET MANY TIMES WE LIMIT GOD BECAUSE OF OUR SMALL THINKING, BECAUSE WE'VE ACTUALLY BEEN THINKING POVERTY, AND IT TAKES MONEY TO ACCOMPLISH WHAT GOD'S CALLED YOU TO DO. YOU KNOW, I'VE TALKED TO MANY PEOPLE THAT HAVE COME TO ME, AND THEY HAVE A VISION OF THEIR CHURCH GROWING OR SOMETHING, BUT IN ORDER TO GET THERE, THEY NEED SOME STAFF. THEY NEED A YOUTH DIRECTOR. THEY NEED A WORSHIP LEADER. THEY NEED AN ASSOCIATE PASTOR. THEY NEED ALL OF THESE OTHER THINGS. BUT AT THE MOMENT, THEY JUST DON'T HAVE THE MONEY TO BE ABLE TO JUSTIFY ALL OF THIS. AND I HAVE TOLD DOZENS OF MY FRIENDS THAT HAVE COME TO ME THAT IF THIS IS TRULY A NEED, NOT JUST YOU KNOW, SOMETHING THAT'S OF YOU, IT'S NOT YOUR FLESH, BUT IF IT'S A GOD DESIRE, AND IF YOU REALLY NEED THIS POSITION, THEN YOU DO WHAT YOU NEED TO DO, AND THE MONEY WILL BE THERE. YOU KNOW, TWO OF THE PEOPLE I'M THINKING ABOUT RIGHT NOW ARE VAN AND REGINA SMITH. MATTER OF FACT, I DID AN INSIDE STORY WITH THEM. THAT'S SOMETHING THAT WE PUT ON OUR WEBSITE. WE DON'T PUT IT ON TELEVISION, BUT IT'S ON OUR WEBSITE, AND I SPENT A 30-MINUTE INTERVIEW WITH THEM, AND WE TALKED SPECIFICALLY ABOUT THIS VERY THING. AND VAN AND REGINA ARE PASTORS OF THE of SOLID ROCK IN ATLANTA, GEORGIA. AND VAN AND REGINA WERE IN A PLACE THAT, uh, I FORGET THE SQUARE FOOT, BUT IT WAS A SMALL PLACE. I MINISTERED THERE, AND YOU COULD PUT A LITTLE OVER 100 PEOPLE IN THERE, BUT THAT WAS CROWDED. YOU CERTAINLY COULDN'T HAVE PUT 200 PEOPLE IN THERE. AND ANYWAY, THEY WERE JUST GREAT PEOPLE. THEY LOVE GOD. AND I WAS THERE, AND I WAS ENCOURAGING THEM THAT YOU NEED TO BELIEVE BIG. AND JUST DOWN THE ROAD, I MEAN JUST A FEW HUNDRED YARDS FROM THEM, WAS A PIANO PLACE, AND IT WAS AVAILABLE, BUT IT WOULD HAVE COST MUCH MORE MONEY, AND IT WAS JUST ANOTHER STEP UP. AND I SAID, LOOK, YOU CAN EITHER STAY HERE AND JUST BARELY GET BY, OR YOU CAN GO DOWN THERE AND DO WHAT YOU NEED TO DO, AND YOUR CHURCH WILL GROW, AND YOU'LL BE ABLE TO SUPPORT IT. AND ANYWAY, IT WAS A HUGE STEP FOR THEM. I FORGET THE EXACT FIGURES, BUT THEY HAD ALSO NEVER TAKEN A uh, SALARY FROM THE CHURCH. AND I TOLD THEM THAT YOU ARE HINDERING THE GROWTH OF THE CHURCH BY NOT TAKING A SALARY BECAUSE THE SCRIPTURE SAYS YOU'RE SUPPOSED TO TAKE CARE OF YOUR OWN, AND IF YOU DON'T, YOU'RE WORSE THAN AN INFIDEL. AND I SAID, YOU'RE DENYING THESE PEOPLE THE RIGHT TO SOW INTO YOUR LIFE. NOW, THEY WERE RETIRED. THEY HAD SOME MONEY. THEY COULD HAVE GOTTEN BY WITHOUT A SALARY. IT WASN'T THAT THEY NEEDED THE SALARY. Uh, MATTER OF FACT, THEY PROBABLY WOULD HAVE BEEN BETTER OR WOULD HAVE FELT BETTER ABOUT NOT TAKING A SALARY. BUT I SAID, YOU NEED TO DO THIS BECAUSE YOU ARE DENYING THESE PEOPLE SOWING INTO YOUR LIFE. AND THAT'S COUNTER TO WHAT GOD PUT IN THE SCRIPTURES. YOU NEED TO DO IT. YOU NEED TO HUMBLE YOURSELF AND RECEIVE A SALARY. SO THEY STARTED RECEIVING A SALARY. THEY MOVED DOWN TO THIS PLACE THAT THE RENT WAS, AGAIN, I FORGET THE DETAILS, BUT IT WAS MORE THAN TWICE WHAT THEY WERE DOING. IT WAS MUCH MORE. PLUS THERE WAS REMODELING. THERE WAS JUST A LOT OF EXPENSES. I MEAN, THEIR EXPENSES TRIPLED, QUADRUPLED OVERNIGHT. AND THEY WERE TESTIFYING THAT THEY'VE NEVER BEEN WITHOUT. THEY'VE NEVER BEEN LATE ON A PAYMENT. THEY PAY IN ADVANCE EVERY SINGLE MONTH. AND IT'S BEEN YEARS. AND EVEN THOUGH IT WAS LIKE THREE OR FOUR OR MORE TIMES WHAT THEY HAD BEEN DOING, GOD CAME THROUGH BECAUSE IT WAS WHAT GOD HAD FOR THEM. IF YOU ARE DOING WHAT GOD HAS TOLD YOU TO DO, GOD WILL SUPERNATURALLY SUPPLY. SO SEE, THAT'S WHAT HE SAID TO THESE DISCIPLES. THEY SAID, YOU GIVE THEM SOMETHING TO EAT. IMMEDIATELY THEY PULLED THEIR WALLET OUT. OH, GOD, WE DON'T HAVE ENOUGH MONEY. SO THE LORD TOLD THEM TO HAVE THE PEOPLE SIT DOWN. HE DIVIDED THEM INTO GROUPS. THERE WAS 5,000 MEN, NOT INCLUDING ALL THE WOMEN AND CHILDREN. AND it, LOOK AT THIS. IT SAYS IN VERSE 41, AND WHEN HE HAD TAKEN THE FIVE LOAVES AND THE TWO FISH, HE LOOKED UP TO HEAVEN AND BLESSED AND BREAK THE LOWES. IT SAYS HE BLESSED WHAT HE HAD INSTEAD OF CURSED IT. MOST OF US WILL SAY, GOD, I KNOW YOU TOLD ME TO DO THIS, BUT I DON'T HAVE ENOUGH. AND WE WILL CURSE IT AND SAY, THIS ISN'T SUFFICIENT. WE CAN'T DO IT. AND WE BEGIN TO START CURSING WHAT WE HAVE INSTEAD OF BLESSING IT. JESUS ONLY HAD FIVE LOAVES AND TWO FISH. HE DIDN'T HAVE ANY MORE THAN THE DISCIPLES HAD, BUT HE BLESSED WHAT HE HAD INSTEAD OF CURSING IT. AND LOOK AT THIS. IT SAYS, HE LOOKED UP TO HEAVEN. YOU KNOW, I'VE GOT AN ENTIRE TEACHING ON THIS. I HAVEN'T GOT TIME TO GO INTO IT TODAY. BUT THE GREEK WORD THAT IS USED HERE IS ANABLEPO. AND IT'S A COMPOUND WORD. THE WORD ANA MEANS AGAIN OR TWICE. AND THEN THE WORD BLEPO MEANS TO SEE. IT'S USED REFERRING TO A PERSON RECEIVING SIGHT. 
that they were able to see. But when it says that he looked up, it's more than talking about that he raised his head. You know what he did? He saw past the five loaves and the two fish, and he looked past the physical into the spiritual. And there's many things involved in this, but it involved the imagination. Jesus saw this five loaves and two fish as sufficient to feed at least 5,000 men. There were women and children. There was probably 12, 15,000 people there, and he saw this little bit of food as being sufficient to feed all of these people. And because he saw it on the inside, then he saw it on the outside. They not only fed the people, they gave them seconds, thirds, as much as they wanted, and they took up 12 baskets full of fragments left over. And if you study this word, anablepo, it's used uh, when people receive their sight. It's, it's the uh, Hebrew counterpart to that word is used over in Daniel chapter 4 when it talks about Nebuchadnezzar, how he had been like an animal and for seven years he had eaten grass. His hair grew like fur. His fingernails became claws because he was lifted up in pride. And finally, it says he looked up. That means more than he raised his head. Finally, he was able to see beyond just what was happening and recognize that God ruled in heaven and he puts over the kingdom the basis of man. His spiritual understanding returned unto him. You could take this same thing and turn over to Ephesians chapter 4. Let me just share a couple of these scriptures with you. But you know, I spent an entire year studying Ephesians chapter 4 verses 17 through 24. And I know that that doesn't sound like I studied the Word much. I went lots of other places, but it was all focused around this, and I got much revelation out of this. But in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17, "...this I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk." Gentiles here is just referring to somebody who didn't have a relationship with God, a non-Jew. And he says, "...don't walk like them in the vanity of their mind. The word vanity here, the Greek word, means the inutility and transientness. Inutility just means you aren't using the sense that God gave you, and transientness means you aren't focused. You aren't fixed in one place. You're just everywhere. You're multitasker. You're doing all of this stuff. Paul said, this one thing I do, Philippians chapter 3, that was the secret to his success. All you've got to do to kill a man's vision is give him two. You got to be focused on things. So this saying, don't be like the Gentiles that don't use their mind, that aren't focused on what their purpose is. They're occupied with all of this other stuff that dilutes their power. And then in the next verse, he says, having the understanding darkened. Did you know that the exact word for understanding here was also translated imagination? I believe it was in Luke chapter 1, verse 51, where... Zacharias was talking about that God has scattered the wicked in the imagination of their hearts and things like this. The same word was translated uh, imagination that was translated understanding. So it says, having the understanding darkened. And this Greek word is dianoia, and it means deep thought. Not just thought, not just surface thought, but deep thought. Your imagination is when you take truths, thoughts, but then you meditate upon them. Boy, if you missed what I was teaching out of Psalms 1, 2, and 2, 1, the same word that was translated meditate in Psalms 1, 2 was also translated imagination in Psalms 2, 1. So to meditate is to use your imagination, your deep thought. You let something sink down on the inside of you until it captivates you and it paints a picture and you see it. You see yourself doing this. Sadly, most of us have seen ourselves cursed. We've seen ourselves a failure. We see ourselves with all these limits on us. If you are going to fulfill God's will, if you're going to take the limits off God, you are going to have to start imagining yourself successful. You're going to have to imagine yourself doing what God has called you to do. If you own a business, DON'T IMAGINE THAT BUSINESS STRUGGLING AND FAILING, EVEN IF IT IS. I'M NOT DENYING THAT THINGS HAPPEN IN THE NATURAL, BUT GO BEYOND THAT LIKE JESUS DID. LIFT UP YOUR EYES 
and a blip, a look beyond what's in your hands and see it the way that God wants it to be. Take the Word of God and see yourself succeeding in that business. See yourself prosper. See yourself healed. See your marriage working. You've got to use your imagination to paint this thing on the inside. You've got to conceive it before you give birth to that thing. And so many people do not do that. So this says that if you have your understanding darkened, that same word was translated imagination. If your, un if your imagination is negative instead of positive, the next thing it says, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. IF YOUR IMAGINATION IS NEGATIVE INSTEAD OF POSITIVE, IT WILL ALIENATE YOU FROM THE LIFE OF GOD THROUGH THE IGNORANCE, AND IT'LL BLIND YOUR HEART TO THE THINGS OF GOD. I'M TELLING YOU, WHAT I'M SAYING HERE IS SO POWERFUL. AND IN MY LIFE, THIS IS EXACTLY WHERE I WAS. I LOVED GOD WITH ALL OF MY HEART. I WAS MOVING IN THE DIRECTION THAT GOD HAD FOR ME, BUT I WAS DOING IT AT A SNAIL'S PACE. I WAS PLAYING IT SAFE. I WAS AFRAID OF FAILURE. I WAS AFRAID OF CRITICISM. I WAS AFRAID OF PERSECUTION. I WAS DOING WHAT GOD TOLD ME TO DO. I WASN'T IN REBELLION, BUT I WASN'T FULFILLING GOD'S PURPOSE BECAUSE I WAS FEARFUL OF ALL OF THESE THINGS, AND I HAD NOT SEEN MYSELF FULLY ACCOMPLISHING THOSE THINGS. AND WHEN THE LORD SPOKE TO ME IN 2002, MAN, I TOOK THE LIMITS OFF GOD. I WENT TO DREAMING AND SAYING, GOD, IF MONEY WASN'T AN OPTION, IF MY INABILITY, MY HICK VOICE, AND ON AND ON YOU COULD GO, ALL OF THESE THINGS THAT ARE LIABILITIES TO ME. IF THESE THINGS WEREN'T AN OPTION, what, WHAT IS IT THAT I BELIEVE YOU WANT ME TO DO? AND I JUST STARTED DREAMING BIG AND DREAMING, AND I'M TELLING YOU, IT IS PHENOMENAL HOW GOD HAS TRANSFORMED MY LIFE AND MINISTRY. AND I KNOW THAT THIS IS NOT JUST FOR PREACHERS. THIS IS NOT JUST FOR ME. THIS IS FOR EVERY ONE OF YOU. GOD PUTS DREAMS IN YOUR HEART. MANY OF YOU KNOW THAT GOD HAS MORE FOR YOU THAN WHAT YOU'RE EXPERIENCING. YOU KNOW IT. AND SOME OF YOU EVEN HAVE SOME OF THE DETAILS. YOU MAY EVEN KNOW LIKE A BUSINESS OR SOMETHING THAT GOD IS WANTING YOU TO DO, AND YET YOU ARE A FAR CRY FROM EVER ACCOMPLISHING IT, AND PART OF THAT IS BECAUSE YOU WON'T ALLOW YOURSELF TO IMAGINE YOURSELF SUCCESSFUL. YOU AREN'T SEEING YOURSELF. THIS WOULD BE LIKE JESUS TAKING THOSE FIVE LOAVES AND TWO FISH, AND IF HE JUST STOPPED RIGHT THERE, AND IF THIS WAS THE ONLY RESOURCE HE HAS, HE WOULDN'T HAVE SEEN IT MULTIPLY. BUT HE LOOKED UP. THIS WORD ANABLEPO, HE LOOKED BEYOND THE PHYSICAL. HE SAW TWICE. HE SAW PAST THE PHYSICAL AND SAW INTO THE SPIRITUAL. HE SAW WHAT WAS POSSIBLE. AND IF YOU CAN SEE IT ON THE INSIDE, THEN YOU'LL SEE IT ON THE OUTSIDE. AND THAT'S WHAT JESUS DID, AND BECAUSE OF IT, THIS GREAT MIRACLE TOOK PLACE. BROTHERS AND SISTERS, GOD HAS A PLAN FOR YOU, AND IT'S BIGGER THAN WHAT YOU THINK. YOU ARE GOING TO HAVE TO TAKE THE LIMITS OFF. YOU ARE GOING TO HAVE TO START IMAGINING, GOD, IF THERE WERE NO LIMITS, if, IF I WASN'T THIS PERSON THAT I AM, IF I COULD BECOME THE PERSON YOU WANT ME TO BE, IF MONEY WASN'T AN OBSTACLE, IF PEOPLE WEREN'T A PROBLEM, WHAT IS IT THAT YOU WANT? AND JUST ALLOW YOURSELF TO START IMAGINING GOD'S WILL COMING TO PASS IN YOUR LIFE. MAN, THIS IS POWERFUL. We hope your heart has been quickened by hearing the Word of God through this message. It's the faithful support of people like you who make this ministry possible. We invite you to prayerfully consider becoming a partner with Andrew Womack Ministries. We maintain a website at awmi.net. Our helpline number is 719-635-1111, or you can write us at P.O. Box 3333, Colorado Springs, Colorado, 80934. Until next time, we pray that you'll reach out by faith and receive everything that's yours through God's grace.